Good morning, Good morning fellow Solutions and Caribbean, Caribbean nationals, nationals at home and abroad. Good morning, Good morning all, all listeners. listeners. I am your host, Dr. Anderson Reynolds at Roof Tropics Media. You have just tuned in to the second episode of Conversations with Dr. Anderson Reynolds on Roof Tropics Media. We are here every Thursday, 9 to 10 a.m. Last Thursday, in our inaugural installment, we had a special guest, St. Lucia's highly esteemed poet, novelist, and playwright, the great MacDonald Dixon, who conversed with us about his life as a writer and about his recently published history-making crime novel, A Scream in the Shadows. And from the many favorable reviews we received, it appears that the conversation resonated very well with the audience. For those of you who missed this first episode, or who would like to listen to it a second time, you can visit our Jaco Television Facebook page for a rebroadcast. We would like very much for you to participate in the conversation this morning. So please call us, call in at 758-489-7090 to pose it questions or to provide comments. On Conversations with Dr. Anderson Reynolds, we intend to bring you in-depth discussions on St. Lucian art and culture, discussions on the pressing social, political, economic, and developmental issues confronting the country, and, and discussions on how the diaspora and St. Lucians and West Indians at home can work together to bring about mutually beneficial change. Today, we want to switch the conversation from culture to the economy. More specifically, we want to talk about the youth economy. In his 2021 election campaign manifesto, the St. Lucia Labour Party had pledged to establish a ministry of the youth economy to administer the programs and activities of the youth economy to provide finance, fiscal incentives, and marketing support to young entrepreneurs to encourage programs that support skills training, mentorship, and the development of emotional intelligence, and to ensure that the youth economy is an integral part of the wider economy. So with regard to the youth economy, this was what the present administration had promised to deliver. And apparently, the Prime Minister, Philippe J. Pierre, and his government is making good on that promise. For in, a, for, for in November last year, the government formally launched its youth economy initiative with a 5.42 million EC dollar grant from the Taiwanese government and the establishment of a youth economic department within the Ministry of Finance and headed by Honorable Wayne Girard, Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development and Youth Economy and Parliamentary Representative of Ancillary Canaries. So then, what is the youth economy? Or what is the government intended focus when it comes to the youth economy? Well, if we define economy as the system of production, distribution, trade, and consumption of goods and services in a country or region, then the youth economy pertains to the production, distribution, and trade in goods and services that are undertaken primarily by the youth. So more simply put, the youth economy is the configuration of economic activities spearheaded by the youth of the country, where the youth population is often defined as persons 15 to 29 years old or persons 15 to 34 years old. Now then, what is the government's intended focus when it comes to the youth economy? Well, let's hear directly from the Prime Minister at his of at his official launching of the youth economy. In its simplest form, the youth economy aims at turning hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business by providing finance, training, marketing, and mentoring to young people seeking self-sustainable employment. The youth economy will create a special space in the economic system for young people to develop and grow their ideas. The youth economy is one step in the pursuit of a dream to create a new economy 
based on technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, where young business people will be participants and not merely observers. Now, according to the Prime Minister, the government isn't merely talking about jobs, about employment. The government is talking about providing young people with the support, meaning financial training and mentorship support, that would enable them to create their own employment by establishing their own businesses, using their technological savvy and creativity and innovativeness to come up with new or improved products and services and new processes. And as if to make sure that, the, that St. Lucian's, and for, for that matter, the whole world know that he means business, last year at the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, the Prime Minister placed his Youth Economy Initiative on the global agenda. So let's take a listen. Mr. President, as we maneuver the tumult of these unprecedented times, the young people must be brought into the mainstream of national development. Too often, the youth are placed on the back burner when things get rough and the belt used for economic tightening is strung around their very necks. Such an approach fails to consider the immense energy enthusiasm and creativity which young people bring to the developmental table. It is for this reason St. Lucia has prioritized the implementation of the youth economy as the new frontier of our economic development formalized in a new government department under the purview of the Prime Minister with the mandate of propelling our young people to turn their talents, skills, and hobbies into economic enterprises for their own empowerment. We see our young people as a resource to be molded and optimized, not as problems to be managed or solved. We believe that a country must consider the aspirations of its young citizens and turn, into, turn them into concrete and practical assets, purposes, and goals. Mr. President, we are committed to improving the lives of our young people, especially the most vulnerable, and we are working with all citizens to assist them in transforming their lives and to make viable contributions to the economy. In this regard, St. Lucia invites the international community to discuss and engage with us strategically on mutual beneficial relationships and projects to promote the youth economy as we seek to build a better and more sustainable future for all. Folks, it seems the Youth Economy Initiative that the Prime Minister is talking about is well on its way. Last month, the government kick-started an entrepreneurship and financial inclusion program called Jenny's to be financed by the Taiwanese and implemented at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. The entrepreneurship and financial inclusion program, Jenny's, include both a three-month incubator program for startup enterprises and a three-month business coaching program for ongoing businesses. 360 participants have already been selected for the program, with a total program enrollment goal of 750 participants. The goal will involve one-on-one -on -one business coaching, seminars, workshops, and hands-on launching and running startup businesses. Philip J. Pierre and the Taiwanese government ought to be applauded, I think, for this initiative because the focus on rescuing the, roof of the, the youth of the country from economic and social malice couldn't have come too soon. Folks, St. Lucia's youth, meaning persons 15 to 29, their unemployment rate for the last five pre-COVID years has averaged about 37% which meant over one-third of our youths were jobless but actively seeking, seeking employment. Likewise, poverty is common among our youths. In 2016, compared to a national average of 25%, 35% of youths age, ages 15 to 19 lived in poverty, and so did 29% of those ages 20 to 24. Research has shown 
that young people are both the primary victims and perpetrators of crimes in the Caribbean, where about 80% of crimes are committed by persons ages 17 to 29. Therefore, with so many of our youths unemployed and living in poverty, it should surprise no one that the crime, that crime has become one of the country's most serious problems. For example, over the 2010-2019 period, St. Lucia registered about 40 murders per year, corresponding to a homicide rate of 23.2 murders per every 100,000 100, population. This homicide rate of 23.2 murders for St. Lucia was more than twice that of Barbados and more than four times that of the US. In a study based on 2018 data, evaluating the crime and safety in Barbados and the six independent Eastern Caribbean states, St. Lucia ranked third in, the, third in murder rate and sexual assaults and first in robberies. The crime situation shows no signs of abating. The 74 murders committed last year were the highest in the nation's modern history. We are less than three months into 2022, yet we have already witnessed no less than 11 hom homicides. From, clearly from the above discussion, it should have become clear that addressing the economic malice of our youth must be a key consideration in setting the country on the path of social and economic progress. After all, the youth represents almost a quarter of the population if we define youth as ages 15 to 29, and almost a third of the population if youth is defined as ages 15 to 34. Thus, any national economic in development initiative that fails to embrace the youth of the country is doomed to languish. Hence today, we have as our special guest, none other than business innovator, Alexander Clark, to discuss the challenges and pitfalls associated with implementing the government's youth economy initiative. I can think of no one better positioned to grapple the social, economic, and existential issues confronting our youth today and to, and to weigh in on the orchestration of the youth economy. Mr. Clark has an extensive involvement in youth and sports, both as an athlete and as an administrator. He played for St. Lucia on both the national basketball team and the national under 18 football team. He served as a youth and sports officer in the Ministry of Youth and Sports for over three years. He also served as the president or other key administrative positions of various Beaufort and national youth and sports organizations. Besides sports, Mr. Clark has gained the reputation of a consummate business innovator who is always brimming with new business ideas. He has founded and led several business enterprises, including MSOL and Stratford Construction. Under the MSOL umbrella, he introduced a business incubator program that turned children as young as eight years old into budding entrepreneurs. He also implemented a very successful youth welding training program where all graduates found employment as welders, some even starting their own welding business. Mr. Clark's involvement in business and youth and sports hasn't gone unnoticed. He has won several sports and business awards, including outstanding youth in business and a, and a FIFA football award. Mr. Clark, welcome to Roof Tropics Media. Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Anderson Reynolds. And thanks very much for taking time off your busy schedule to converse with us on the youth economy. Yes, thank you very much and good morning listeners. Um, it's a pleasure being there. Whenever it comes to the business of youth in our country, it's always exciting you know, to discuss what um, will take you forward in this country. So I want to say good morning to everyone. Mr. Clark, if we agree 
that the whole issue of the youth economy boils down to one problem, employment. Then besides entrepreneurship and self-employment, shouldn't the government's youth economy initiative focus on all employment? After all, although the government's youth economy initiative is an, is an applaudable effort, it can't, it can't be expected to make much of a dent in youth unemployment, at least not in the short and medium term. And medium term. Our youths are in trouble, and unemployment, I think, is one of the biggest hurdles they face. So shouldn't the focus be on the full employment of our youth, meaning ensuring that all our youths are employed, whether it be self-employed or salaried employment? Well, um, I, sh I think that um, it is very important for us to employ every youth in this country. And government should focus on full employment um, reason for saying this, um, for instance, if we have um, trained 1,000 entrepreneurs, and then let's say, for example, that they employ at least four, four, four youth, then we still have um, a, a, a total, a, a large sum of young people still unemployed. I think one of the things that um, government can do is to use... Um, the strategy, the strategy that they used in 1998 when they started the STEP program, where they had um, young people in internship. With that, that will cause direct employment for a number of our youth, and they will also be trained um, being attached to other institutions. So when you say internships, you're talking about um, job internships? Job internships. Um, whereas um, they can go in there and make a contribution to the, to the, to the businesses, um, help them develop. They too will be developed by um, learning new skills um, in the process of doing this. So I guess you are saying besides um, self-employment, we should also be pursuing employment generally, employment at business firms, employment at other institutions and, and so forth yes this should be done but it should be done immediately because um, if we look at the numbers in terms of youth that are unemployed it shows that there is an urgent need to 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 start off um, young people being employed and um, I think the time should be is now and we should waste no time in doing so now, the numbers that have been bandied around as far as youth unemployment, we are looking at 15,000, according to the Prime Minister himself, 15,000 unemployed youth. Um, so I quite agree that even if the youth economy, that we, which according to the Prime Minister will be focusing on self-employment and entrepreneurship, even if this was successful, say, and say we were able to employ a thousand youths as self self-employed youths, this would still leave thirteen thousand youths unemployed. So this helps emphasize the point that the prime minister's um, initiative, youth economy initiative, may not go far enough in remedying our youth. The, our, the, the unemployment problem our youth faces. But since the government and the prime minister is really focusing on entrepreneurship, really focusing on getting youths to start their own business, how active are our St. Lucian youths in entrepreneurship? Are our youths up to the challenge of taking advantage of the prime minister's youth economy initiatives? How much of an entrepreneurial culture do we have in St. Lucia? And should part of the Youth Economy Initiative be focusing on developing an entrepreneurial culture in St. Lucia? What are your thoughts on um, um, do, We do not have an entrepreneurial culture in St. Lucia. Um, most of us, or uh, most young people, get into business when they're in the late 30, 20s and early 30s. And um, by starting off at this age, it, it puts us at a disadvantage. I think like what the government should focus on is 
to have young people starting at a very tender age. With um, MSOL, we're realizing that even um, um, children at the age of eight can, can, can start their own business. And if we develop that culture, then this would be very good for um, our country. Okay. Um, yes, um, one, one suspects, or maybe one thought that came to mind, is that some people turn to, to entrepreneurship out of desperation when they cannot find a job anywhere else. <laughs> so it's like um, starting their own business or getting involved, uh, becoming entrepreneurs, is like a, a last res resort when they get involved in out of desperation. So you are saying it should not be out of desperation. Um, we should inculcate in our young people from an early age the spirit, the culture of entrepreneurism so that they see starting their own business as a, as a viable option to salaried employment. Now, um, are you aware of other cultures that, may, that we can look at that exhibit a more entrepreneurial culture? Um, are there other groups of people that may be more entrepreneurial in their outlook than St. Lucian's? Any um, thoughts? Yeah. If, if we look at um, in China, what has been done is that young people start at a very early age. Um, we look at places like um, Japan, even um, in England, the United States, we have what we call um, kids incubators, where even kids are being incubated at a very, very tender, at a very early age. And um, in, in St. Lucia, I don't even think that we have a business culture, um, uh, an entrepreneurial culture. I think um, what we have is more or less like hustlers, you know, people just trying to hustle here and there. You know, we have nothing that is organized, formalized. We, we, um, in terms of taking it beyond just St. Lucia, we ha we'll have a, 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 a difficult task. If we look at some of the business, business, um, businesses that are successful in, in St. Lucia, we look at the Duboulets, the, the, the Chastenays, and, and, and um, other companies. What has happened is that they started very early. And these, these people went into business at a very tender age. So that helped them now to become very good and successful entrepreneurs. Yes, I think I can um, provide some support to, to your comment. Because right now I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book called Race and St. Lucian Politics. And in that book, I'm tracing the history of St. Lucia's Creole whites. And um, one of the things that jumps that jumped at me was, um, in the past, uh, most of these families, they never saw their children as going and seek employment elsewhere. It seems, it seems like they have always been um, focusing on sending their children overseas to gain education and expertise, and for the children to come back and join the family business, which suggests that right from an early age, the children are inculcated in the habit of entrepreneurship. And right from the start, they see themselves more as being self-employed persons joining the family business, expanding the family business, than going out and look for employment. But another a following question comes to mind. Do you think in St. Lucia we have a stigma against business? <laughs> Do you think in our psyche we think um, getting into business is a bad thing as, as if business people are corrupt people or, and so forth? Is that, do you think we have that kind of stigma in St. Lucia? We do. I remember um, a young boy at the age of eight um, said to me, why should he go into business when um, those that are in business are corrupt um, they, they are manipulative. Um, they use other avenues like drugs and, and these things to, to get into business. So um, there is that stigma. If you can get that from a, 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 young, a young child at this age, then, you know, let us understand what we are hearing on the streets and what we know. 
that um, business in itself, you know, to, to many young people in workshops that I've had, they are saying that how do we judge the success of a business? Um, is it because they are still operating? Um, are, they, are, they, are they at a loss? Where are they covering up the loss? And, and, and things that um, they see in the, in, the, in the business sometimes is not encouraging. You know, sometimes they feel like it is better that they go and sell drugs than to open up a, a business. So we have to now look into ways of changing that type of thinking in young people because it do exist. Okay, very interesting. This, this has opened up a whole new area of this course, um, uh, business, um, uh, how business operates in St. Lucia, um, how do they, are they as... Do the businesses we think are viable and successful, are they viable and successful on the basis of legitimate business? This is a whole um, topic of discussion, um, which maybe we can revisit in another show. But moving on, let me ask you my third question. Um, uh, it is all fair and well to present programs, I think, and initiatives which on paper sound excellent, some sound like a home run, a six out of the pack. But oftentimes, the, su the success of such initiatives has a lot to do with how they are implemented and the capabilities, commitment, and passion of those heading the implementation. So then, what are the pitfalls the government must be mindful of in, in orchestrating the youth economy? Very good question, Anderson. Um, one of the things that we have seen happening is that we have a lot of organizations, a lot of, um, a lot of training is being done, um, but this training, we, we don't have a way of, of measuring this training success. And at the end of the day, while we do all this training, we have nothing to show us that this was successful. Government must, be, must take note of, of, of these things, that we don't continue repeating things that are not successful or might not be successful. Um, many times we have these, these programs, it does not reach the grassroots people, the people that needs it the most. So we have um, all programs like booths and, and, and things from um, NRDF and these other organizations. And what you, you see is that these young people do not attend these programs. And if booths have something, um, NRDF have something, NSDC have something, what you realize that happened that is the same set of people continue going to these um, sort of programs. What we have seen even with NSDC is that we train a lot of young people and a lot of people and we train them, like, for instance, cake making. Thousands of people are trained in, in cake decoration and cake making. Um, I'm trying to understand how do we benefit from this um, where the economy is concerned. You know, um, what amount of cakes can we make for St. Lucia? You know, and are, are we doing anything that will help us to, to export these cakes into other countries? So um, I think we have to, um, government must, must take note. And also, we have... Um, people that are not that have no passion, and things are, are put into the wrong organizations in terms of developing young entrepreneurs, and I have seen it happen over and over again, and it is of great concern that I think it is a pitfall that the government must take note of that these things that they are doing will not, will reach the people that they want it to to reach. Can you elaborate a bit more on? Um, the people they may put in charge of these programs may not be um, um, passionate people. They may not. They may be the wrong persons to to implement those programs. For, because, for example, uh, I watch a panel discussion that involved mostly young people, and one of the things they said was that oftentimes um, the, um, these uh, these entities are set up to supposedly help them start businesses and so on, but when they co go for help, the, these entities, more often than not, they, these entities frustrate them, put more blocks, um, hindrances in their way that discourages them and, and until some of them give up. And sometimes the satisfying the requirements for the help 
is very um, uh, intimidating. Lots of paperwork and so forth and so on. So, so that discourages a lot of young people from, from participating in those programs. Also, um, one of the audience in, that attended the panel discussion said that, I mean, he's a gamer. He, he develops um, uh, games, video games. And he said in his young days, in his youth, he, he met with several such agencies that were set up to help the, the, the youth. And, and it seems like he was ahead of his time at the time. And the people in charge were not in tune with, they were not in tune with what he was bringing, what he was put, bringing into the picture. Um, uh, they, 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 they were just not on board. They didn't understand some of the ideas he was putting forward and so forth. So they never, they, so he never got far with, with getting any kind of help from these entities. Okay, um, understand one of the things that we have to understand is that most of these people that are running these programs or, or, or financial institution that young people have to go to do not even embrace what we call innovation. Innovation is something that is done outside of the box, something maybe sometimes that have never been done before. Um, you find ways to make something work that you realize that, is, that has not been working. And what you find, even when you go to the financial institutions, that they, you come with an innovative idea and they ask you, where have you seen that? This has not worked anywhere, you know? And then they just push you aside and, and because you have an innovative idea. And if we are talking about innovation, when young people will be going to some of these people that are going to, um, to help them out, they will be coming with innovative ideas. And the question is, if some of us believe to work just by the book or what we learn, then we will have serious problem working with young people in terms of, of, of helping them to be great entrepreneurs. You know, the, the greatest idea will come out with something that sounds crazy, you know, but it is important that we, um, young, um, the people that would be leading um, the course in terms of training young people in these areas understand these things. Yes, so the question, the, the question is, we are setting up the youth economy but are we ready for the young people? Are we ready for them? So let's continue. Um, a related issue is that, um, according to the data, startups are more likely to fail than to succeed. For example, according to research, about 90% of US startups fail. In St. Lucia, we have or have had a number of programs in support of youth entrepreneurship and business startups including the Chamber of Commerce, Youth Business Trust, Boost that you mentioned a while ago. So Arthur Lewis um, College has a gateway to global careers program. There is the Small Enterprise Development Unit, better known as SEDU. And I think um, the St. Lucia Development Bank have a youth enterprise equity program. And of course there is Bell Fund. And I'm sure you might, ha you might be aware of others that I don't know of. So the question is, um, given that so many startups fail, and given that we have had a number of programs and in initiatives to stimulate the youth economy, even though it wasn't called that, how successful are these programs, you reckon? Will the government new youth economy initiative be any different in terms of effectiveness? Well, from what I'm hearing, it, it don't look to me like it would be any different. Um, we have, um, you hear about um, that they are going to put things together in terms of making it easy for young people to gain finance. This has been there. We have had the Bell Fund program, you know, where young people would get, you know, um, funding. And at the end of the day, approximately, I don't know how much, but about 90% um, of these businesses are not in existence. We, we can talk about um, to see how things are done um, for young people. It would be the same, 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 same old thing that we will continue to see. Simply because the same funding, the same, um, they say no red tape, but I'm afraid we might have a lot of these things um, happening. Um, 
where, young, where businesses are, are concerned. So I don't see anything new. I don't see anything um, different unless like we really truly embrace innovation um, for what it is. I think that's where we will see some results. Well, this takes me to my follow-up question. Um, if this is your assessment of what has of the past, what have, what have been done in the past to stimulate the youth economy. If this is your assessment, what can be done to improve the viability and sustainability of entrepreneurs and business startups? Um, one of the things that I think that needs to be done, you know, um, people start up businesses and before two years, it's, it, it's, it's gone. Waste, a lot of money have been wasted. A lot of time has been wasted. Um, I think government need to use um, organizations that um, to maintain, um, to help maintain these businesses. Let's take, for instance, someone might be very versed in terms of um, carpentry, but this person don't have the management skills. Now, if you have to teach this person all these things, we'll find ourselves in trouble. So we should have an, 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 a central organization, whereas these people will be doing these people accounting and and marketing to, to help them to, to develop until they can really truly go on their own. We are dropping these, these, these young business people too early and not enough support. And when I talk about support, I'm not just talking about mentoring and, and, and financial. I'm talking about um, support to see that they survive um, at least two years so that they can go on their own. Um, so if I get you correctly, um, we should bring these young people on the maybe existing firms that can provide them with uh, management and guidance, guidance, guidance on a long-term basis, um, two, three years, um, kind of hold their hands and um, be almost like partners with them until they are fully, um, uh, fully incorporated, fully um, uh, where they have, um, they, they are fully um, well versed, become well versed in the world of business? Um, that is part of it, but we must also be very mindful that a lot of these businesses, when you go in things like internship or even um, partnership, they, they don't really have time for you. They really have time in terms of really looking, in terms of making money. So I'm talking about something even bigger than, than this. Um, I think at MSOL, we, um, we, we, we have tried it, we have tested it. Um, to see that um, young people will have their, their own business and whereas they would partner with us. And where they are weak, we will be handling it. So we are, what we are actually saying, if you are weak in marketing, we'll be doing your marketing for you. Um, if you are um, weak um, in, 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 in sourcing um, finance for new equipments and things of this sort, we, we, we help you out in, in that way. So I think I'm talking about something that will work, not something that, that have been tried and have failed. Um, like using other businesses. I myself have gone, have gone through that system of being placed with, with a business and they don't, they don't even have time. You call someone you know, to help you out in a certain thing and they don't have time for you. So tell us a little bit more about MSOL, how it is structured to help manage other businesses. Okay, um, MSOL is, um, is a market solution um, and market solution enterprises. Um, the way it is structured is to help um, other businesses to grow and um, to help young budding entrepreneurs to, to, to be successful. So um, we match, um, we match um, employers with um, job seekers. Um, we, 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 we help um, um, people to partner with, um, with each other and we help in the whole marketing aspect. Um, of, of, of business. Um, so I guess, based on your experience at MSOL, you are proposing that this can be one direction the government can adopt, meaning use established management, business management companies like MSOL to provide the umbrella for, for startups and so on. Yes, you're, you're quite right. I think we have a, a very good model that can, that can be used, and it has been tested. Um, it has been tested with um, kids when we started the Youth Business Kids Incubator. Um, we, had, um, we have young people from the age, the tender age of eight, that, that took part in this, and these, people can, these children now can 
do their own website. They understand what it is to do their own barcodes, and um, they can they can do their own Facebook page, Instagram, you know, on on their own with little guidance, you know. After and with the kids incubator, it was like heads on, you know. It's not just like theory, but they had to go to the supermarkets and understand what the barcode is about, how it's been tested, why, you know? Um, um, they, they understand all these things. Go to the banks and, and learn how to open their, their own bank accounts. And a number of things came out, even from the um, kids incubator, that we understand that there was a particular um, kid that was saying, like, we are saving our monies in the credit unions, and we cannot use it for our business. And to them, that was just something that was not right. You know, how can I, I, I save my money and now I'm into business, I open up my business and I, I cannot use the money. So that, that was very interesting. Uh, another thing that came out of it is that they were saying, why is it is my mother that have to register my business? Because they don't have the, they, they want their own ID card, the national ID. And, and, and when we look at these things, um, these kids were saying, like, look, we need to feel like we are responsible for what is ours and, and not um, the bank holding on to our money. We don't have a national ID. You know, these things, and we cannot register our own business. And they, they find it was really something really backward. So in, in the kids incubator, we, we discovered these things. Not only that, they came out with the most brilliant ideas you could ever find. Um, I remember a, a young boy at the age of eight um, could come up in terms of um, bagging charcoal and, and, and putting it on supermarket shelves. Um, we had kids that were um, actually doing donuts and these things and placing it in the supermarket at the age of eight to, to, to 13, to 12. Wow. So um, it was, it, it's something that um, is breathtaking. Um, um, for, for, for young people. And what was lacking in this program um, is actually, you know, finance for continuity, you know. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, moving forward that we can start developing young entrepreneurs to be successful. Well, that was very illuminating, Mr. Clark. Um, very interesting. Um, one of the goals of um, Roof Tropics Media is to make sure that the diaspora um, is part of, 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 the, of our programming um, to target the diaspora along, along with St. Lucians at Home to target the diaspora, both St. Lucians and other Caribbean nationals. Now, in New York, I'd, I have run into St. Lucian professionals who have either just retired or are about to retire and who have indicated that they have discretionary income and would like to contribute towards the development of St. Lucia. But the problem is they don't know how best to go about making their contribution count. So then, how do you see the diaspora helping to advance St. Lucia's youth economy as defined by the Prime Minister or otherwise? Um, there are a few ways. Um, one of the ways that they can do that is um, partnership with young budding entrepreneurs, people that are just starting up. Um, in any business, you need investors. And this could be um, one way of, of, of helping um, young people get into um, in being successful. Um, also, um, um, in terms of um, mentorship, you know, helping them based on what they are seeing, on the on um in, in in the in the wider world where they too can share a lot with young people um a, another way is like um msoul had a program called uh, um the welding the youth welding program where young people came um learning how to to weld um both male and female and out of that we we, we had a startup program we, we had a program with it individual and what happened is that at least at least um four of them um continued on a full scale basis two of them opened their own welding um service two of them are actually working with um other welders and one of the problems that they were being faced with is getting 
partners, people to help them. The diaspora can help in that way in terms of even seeking in helping them in, 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 in finding some of the things that they, they need or to help them um, partnering with them um, in terms of starting um, developing their own business. So very good, but of course the persons in the diaspora who don't know, who are not present in St. Lucia, they, they may not know who is doing what so there, there would need to be a mechanism to in the matching of um, the, the, um, the people, persons in the diaspora with, the, with St. Lucians who are in need of the help. So, so maybe this may be a, a task for the government. How do you, you identify people in the diaspora that wants to invest or want to mentor St. Lucians? How do you match these people with St. Lucians at home who are in need of the help. In passing, one idea that has been bandied um, around is something like a mutual fund where St. Lucia has a development fund that St. Lucians both at home and abroad can invest in where they, for their investment they will own shares in the fund and that becomes, and that fund can serve as an investment mechanism, a development mechanism. Um, it is, in a way, it is um, a capital. F it is a form of F FDI in a way, and it can be used to finance some of our high priority development projects. Um, this idea has been bandied, ar bandied around for quite a while. Yes, let us um, go back to youth and sports because you spend a lot of your, of your youth in youth and sports. Um, and, and you know, St. Lucia has a network of youth and sports councils that include the National Youth Council, youth and sports officers, and a youth and sports council in each constituency district. Is that correct? Yes. In your younger days, you were a major factor in Viewfort and St. Lucian sports, both, at, both as national sportsman and a sports administrator. Given that youths are naturally drawn to sports, what role do you see this system of youth and sports councils and officers playing in advancing the youth economy? What changes would you suggest in the structure and operation of the youth and sports council that will make them better able to serve that purpose? Now, um if, if we um, if we examine what has been happening with youth and, and sports councils, I think now um, one of the things that I'll suggest is that they turn um, clubs into businesses. Um, reason for saying this because worldwide, if you are in a, in an in an organization, a club, you, you become automatically the club runs a business. So we don't teach that. Um, the second thing, we should have the Youth and Sports Council, you know, helping, de being developed so that it can help clubs to become businesses, not just going and, and take part in sports, but helping them in their overall development. Um, the National Youth Council, too, um, must play their role in terms of training, you know, for young people um, in the line of, of, of business. So uh, due to time, you know, I know it's, it, 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 it might take um, a lot, but there is lots to, to discuss. <laughs> Let's take, for instance, if we take the Youth and Sports Council, I think a, a, sub, a better subvention must be given to Youth and Sports Councils. They must have a secretariat. It is not like business like usual where you're running all over asking somebody to type something for you, no, youth, no officers and, and these things. The Youth and Sports Officers, too, their they, they, they role must, must be a little different in terms of they should be trained also to help young people in business because the, 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 the youth development itself is a, is a, is a business. And um, I think we should look into, into things that would help them along that line. So the system of sports clubs, youth and sports cons councils must also play a role in, in, in um, guiding people, young people, as far as employment, as far as starting their own business as far as generating income. And the focus should not just be on sports, 
but on social, but also on social and economic development of the youth. Yeah, also to get the grassroots um, people, the young people, which we say that are in the ghettos and these things, they come through the sporting system. They can only engage. Some of them will only engage if they are in youth organizations, you know, and um, they are invited to 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 this type of um, um, tra and to, to to be invited in training. So it is important that. Um, the Youth and Sports Council rule um, is defined in a way that would um, help these young people to become business entrepreneurs. Now, Mr. Clark, um, there is interest, maybe even renewed interest, in enticing youth into agriculture, not only to serve as a source of employment, but also as a way to address our food security problems, which COVID highlighted in no uncertain terms. The youth agricultural entrepreneurship project is one such attempt to draw youth into farming. I know through your involvement in the St. Lucia Forage Movement, you have some experience with youth in agriculture. What then are some of the challenges or hurdles the government will need to address or surmount to get young people into farming? Um, one of the biggest problems that young people have in terms of going into farming is land. And we do not have what we call a land bank, and the land bank is um, land put aside specifically for agriculture. Are we going to ask a young person to go into agriculture? There is no land available, you know, to do um, certain um, farming. Um, with this, young, um, we have a system where a lot of the elderly folks have left agriculture. And these lands are just abandoned. You know, I think government can look into leasing these lands and giving it to young people so that they can start developing something for themselves where agriculture is concerned. And then we can have um, good um, food security and sustainability. But it must be backed up by technology and it must be backed up by um, equipment because it is very expensive to to go into agriculture. So government can put um, things like um, tractors, you know, that could plow and, and have um, proper irrigation greenhouses that would be available to young people whereas they can use these things and, you know, make a meaningful contribution in agriculture. So you, so you see agriculture as a viable, a, a viable way, a viable means of propelling the youth economy and generating additional youth employment? Yeah, um, without agriculture, I'm saying that we are in serious trouble. Um, food security um, is, is a major um, or big factor that we have to consider. What is happening in the world today with um, Ukraine and Russia and, and the, the, the prices of, of food is, is, is becoming something unbearable. So I think um, if we looked at um, young people going into agriculture, and whereas we look at the things that we need in agriculture, not just telling everybody going to, um, into bananas and things of um, bananas, we should look at things like um, marijuana cultivation, hemp, you know, the development of, 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 of these, um, these things that could help young people get fast returns. Um, from, from agriculture. We must diversify in a way that would help us to, to, to maximize on, on, on profits so that um, our economy can, can, can gain something positive. Folks, we are nearing our hour and the, the end of our hour. Um, but before I forget, I would like to remind you that next week we have a very special treat for you. The indomitable and award-winning actress and movie producer Mafra Emmanuel of, of Ayanola Pictures will be our special guest, who with four movies under her belt is single-handedly pioneering the movie industry in St. Lucia. She will be talking to us about her life in the movies, the potential of the St. Lucia film industry, and her, and her soon-to-be-released fifth movie, Shante's World. Now, Mr. Clark, your uh, M Soul um, program uh, turning eight year olds into budding, budding entrepreneurs. I find it very intriguing. Um, what got you motivated to undertake this venture? Uh, I mean, what, what, because I don't think um, too many people sit around and say, 
and say to themselves, let me get eight year olds into business. Um, what I realized, um, you know, the story, it really started with a, an adopted son that he was always asking, mommy, daddy, how can I make my own money? <laughs> and he, he was always um, the type that wanted to um, get things to sell. And if he worked for you, he wants to be paid because he wants his own money to do his own thing. And he also had this dream that he wants to be a, a, a millionaire. And I'm um, realizing that it was one of the things that motivated me. Um, and also, I, I was realizing that we do not have um, a entrepreneurial culture in, in, in St. Lucia, and we need to start at a very early age. And I think that's um, one of the things. And while it, is been, while it has been tested, I can tell you, these young people have ideas or skills and talent that is unbelievable, you know? So um, what really motivated me was my adopted son and wanting to see St. Lucia culture change to an entrepreneurial culture. And I believe that we were supposed to start at a very early age. Thank you. I'm sure your, the parents and the kids were very happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if we have time for another question. Um, maybe, but um, one but, of but, but um, um, maybe let me ask you my final question. Um, this new Labour government speaks often about instilling, instilling national pride, fostering national identity, protecting and appreciating our history and cultural heritage. Is there any connection between patriotism, national pride, and national identity, and the social and economic problems that our youths are facing? Would addressing these issues, as the government seems inclined to do, help in the success of the youth economy? Yes. Um National pride is, is, a, is, is, is one of the things that will help our youth economy. Um, if young people appreciate what is theirs, what is ours, um, the pride that we have in terms of developing our country, it would be a motivating factor for young people. Yes, Mr. Clark, we are just about out of time. Um, yes, folks. Um, this is the, you have just listened to the second episode of Conversations with Dr. Anderson Reynolds, only at, youth, at Roof Tropics Media. Mr. Clark, thanks very much for being our guest, our special guest. The conversation with you was very enlightening. St. Lucians at home and abroad, Caribbean folks, the world for that matter, thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to visit us again next Thursday, same time, 9 to 10, at Roof Tropics Media, Conversations with Dr. Anderson Reynolds. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>